I've been coming to this for a long time, and so the intent for this to, is to be more like the small meetings that, that we get to go to sometimes, the Gordon conferences and the Keystone meetings, and we're really, you, for these small meetings, you should think of us not as trainees and, and old people, but as colleagues who are all interested in some of the same topics. And so I, I'm happy to entertain questions or comments anytime through this. And I, I really kept this number of slides to a low level because these are things that I just want to talk to other people about and get input on some of the experiences others of you may have had in the context of biobanking and electronic health records. And I'm talking about confounding because that it's always an issue. Um, genetic studies can be confounded in lots of different ways, but especially in the context of electronic health records data, um, it, it's, a, it's an issue. Eventually, every single medical center will be a biobank. And so um, we will, everybody will be dealing with this at some point because genetics will be everywhere and, and, and so any place that has electronic health records will have the opportunities and challenges. So our biobank um, is called BioView. Um, it was started in the early 2000s. And we have about 300,000 DNA samples now. All of our phenome, every single bit of the medical phenome that we have is electronic health records data. We have very little, uh, virtually no data yet, although we hope to obtain more through things like My Health at Vanderbilt, which is a way for patients to interact with their electronic health records and to potentially provide information on, say, some of the kinds of inventories that are part of the UK Biobank. And if you play off something like BioView against the UK Biobank in terms of the phenome, here are the key points to remember, and it, it's such a, it has such a profound effect on a lot of the comparisons that you would make between any medical center-based biobank and any biobank like the UK biobank that involves a cohort of individuals who are all tested for everything or fill out invent, you know, the same inventories as they start the study and may update periodically the phenotypes through, um, through regular mail contact with participants. Some, some of the UK Biobank participants have participated in other studies. So smaller, there are smaller sub-studies within the UK Biobank. But, but they collect, so all of the quantitative traits that they measured, they measured as people on everybody as people came into the study. We have only electronic health records data in an active medical center taking care of patients every day. Half of our, at least about half of our biobank, we don't even have a clinical blood count. I mean, we, we don't have cell count measures because they haven't had that particular blood test ordered. We don't see kidney function measures on everybody we see kidney function measures on the people that physicians are afraid are developing kidney function problems or might in the future develop kidney function problems. We don't get information on blood glucose on just anybody, only people that the physicians are worried might develop diabetes. It's the southeastern part of the United States and the BMI the BMI distribution makes us look like a different species from the people in the UK biobank. So, because it's not just that people are more obese in the southeast quadrant of the United States, is that obese people have many more health problems that take them to medical centers. So our population that is seen regularly by physicians at Vanderbilt is more obese than the average Nashville resident. And yeah, probably about the same obesity as the average Tennessee resident, but it's a, 
there are so many differences that, that we should expect between EHR-based medical center biobanks and population-based biobanks that really collect fairly uniform information on all of its participants. So that's, that's the first, first thing to think about. The second thing to really keep reminding yourself about is that a physician, a physician diagnosis is not truth, it's data. A lab result is not truth, it's data. It's all data to compute over to try to learn more about truth. And that's a direct quote from the man at Vanderbilt who developed the idea of of an electronic health record system now more than 35 years ago at Vanderbilt. We built our own electronic health record systems because we had a number of physicians who were engineers as undergraduates, knew computer science and thought, and really thought that, that we will do better computing over all of the data to understand what's going on than to than to believe in the truth of any part of that data. Because it's not that, it's not that physicians are making, you, we see diagnostic patterns that are consistent with a diagnostic odyssey all the time in these electronic health records where people start out with one diagnosis, usually a fairly common diagnosis, and then over time it shifts maybe to, to maybe even two or, or three much rarer conditions as more parts of the phenotype unfold and the diagnosis is no longer consistent with the first, with the horse, it becomes a zebra over time. That's not error. That's not misdiagnosis. That's, that's just physicians reacting to the changes in the course of a regular illness and trying to use their best understanding of what what this patient has, what their future will bring. And we use a lot of structured data like billing codes. Um, we, we use things like pharmacy records, but also just prescri prescription information. We can't know if the patients fill the prescription if they fill it off site. So, so that there's, there's some disconnect on the information related to drug use. The billing codes, <laughs> the physicians have to bill for something. When a physician refers a patient to a specialist, uh, say a rheumatologist for a, a workup on lupus, they, they have to bill for something. So they will, it will be a lupus workup, so they, they have a lupus code. They're ordering tests to check on whether this patient will get a diagnosis of lupus. And I will tell you for lupus, many of those are, are rule out codes that lots of people get referred because the symptoms of lupus are highly variable at the beginning of the disease. And it, it will often take some time to be certain of the diagnosis without some of the commonly used tests for lupus being positive. So, so those tests will get run. Physicians will interpret the tests and way more times than not, that first diagnosis is the only one you see because they, the physicians rule out lupus as a cause of the, the patient's symptoms. But there's a lupus code in the record then. And so, again, that's data. The patient had some symptoms consistent with lupus. There was a lupus work. If we did text mining the physician notes, we'd see the rule out diagnosis. But using the structured data, is a lot, it's not just a lot easier, but it's also a lot more portable to other sites. Not, not all sites can do electric, text mining of electronic health records data, although, yes, automated, automated approaches will, will eventually help us there too. But, but if we see a lupus diagnosis every six months over the past three years for a patient from a rheumatologist, that patient has lupus. They're, they've been diagnosed, they're being treated for it. We can often see the first line meds are consistent with a diagnosis of lupus. 
So there are a lot of ways to use the data to get to truth, but, but lots of the pieces, the, the individual data points, are pretty noisy, are pretty um, misleading even about the ultimate diagnosis the patients will have. So the data quality for electronic health records data will never be as high as the quality of research data collected for research purposes where we screen these people, we may have an MRI image that confirms a certain neurodegenerative condition. We may have images here, but we won't necessarily have them on every patient because if, they're, if their ALS was diagnosed somewhere else and they're coming with, us, coming with their diagnosis, that, won't necessarily, that image won't be part of our records, um, even though the diagnosis was securely made. So the, the quality of the data won't, won't ever be as good as research quality data, but it can be made to be good enough. I mean, in, the only reason that, we, that I'm standing here is that people worked very hard at the beginning of this to devise straightforward algorithms for getting two diagnoses that were sufficiently re repeatable for genetic studies that you could recover the same, the same heritability estimates, the same top signals in a GWAS with pretty similar effect sizes. So, so you, can, you can use the information from the EHR to pretty much replicate existing genetic findings. And in fact, looking to do that is not a bad way to test diagnostic algorithms. It's a, I mean, it's a useful heuristic lots of us um, try to use for, for the quality of the data that we end up with after cleaning. And, and the huge value is that when we can link genomics data, we have a very rich database. And because we built our electronic health records more than 30 years ago, we have on average 10 to 15 years of electronic health records on people in our system. And, and, and that's remarkable in some ways because I, I think it's been said many times, the average American has only five years of insurance-based um, data because insurance companies change about every five years for the average American, whether that's the company they work for changing their insurance carrier or them moving to another job. Um, so 10 to 15 years of electronic health records data helps make this feel a bit like a cohort study. And, and that can be very good for, for really looking at longitudinal trajectories. For me, one of, the big, one of my big interests in this is pleiotropy. How does genetics impact multiple phenotypes simultaneously? And I think um, one of my big interests is is to try to understand whether there are earlier onset phenotypes, um, as, as Lisa mentioned in her talk, that may be predictive of later onset phenotypes, so that we could really think differently about clinical trials. If you think about the disease, like Alzheimer's as a condition, waiting until people have some cognitive decline and the diagnosis of Alzheimer's is not optimal for treatment, right? But if there are pleiotropic effects of that same genetic variation, then, then we've, got, we've got a shot. So in our biobank right now, um, about just under half the sample has um, genotype or sequence data already available. Um, and, that, and it's probably half now. Um, but all of it's going to be sequenced over the next year or so. So we've got common variant interrogation on about 130 to 150,000 now, because uh, more data get generated all the time. And we've, we've used that, to, in the common variants, to impute transcriptomes, metabolomes. Now more of the, the protein-based measurements um, are being imputed into the biobank. So that we look at just the genetically predicted expression of genes across the medical phenome, the imputed metabolomes across the medical phenome, and so forth as just more ways to see 
to, to put function to genome variation. But part of the huge advantage of electronic bio, health system biobanks in the context of medical centers is that in addition to the people that you have, both the genetics and the phenome data on, you've got a whole bunch of additional people with just the phenome data. So this, this represents sort of medical home people that have a certain number of codes over three to five years. Um, so 2.8 million people. So it'd be, it'd be closer to 4 million people if you just took all comers, but, but people who touch the healthcare system once are not really very informative for anything we want to do, even with just phenome. So, so having some level of medical home is helpful um, at Vanderbilt, you know, some multi multiple codes over some period of time. And so the opportunity to iterate back and forth between discoveries in this space and some kind of validation with the omics data or the genomics is hugely valuable and vice versa. There are often, you know, we think we see pleiotropy in the genetics data and then you can often show phenome correlation across, you know, an orthogonal set it doesn't include anybody in the biobank in terms of just the, the correlation um, of, the, of, that, of that phenome. So this, so I came for this. I went to Vanderbilt for this. When I, I, I went there about nine years ago, after 28 years at the, very happy years at the University of Chicago. And I went because I thought I could do my science better with access to this really cool resource. But it's this part of the resource that has blown me away at, at the opportunities, the untapped opportunities for geneticists to make hay with this, or, or as we, we sometimes call it, valuing the haystack, not just, not just those golden needles that sometimes get stuck in the haystacks, but really embracing the haystack and thinking about the polygenicity of disease at the level of phenome. Um, so so I, I don't want to throw away any data. I, I, I really love the opportunity to, to iterate into phenome here. But confounding is just a fact of everyday life with these kinds of data. We are doing, in a sense, uh, you know, retrospective studies on data already collected all the time. And, and the, these are confounded in, as I said, lots of different ways. The data are not missing at random. They are so not missing at random. They're, and they're correlated in really complicated ways that reflect, you know, just the vagaries of what a general inter, how a general internist makes a diagnosis versus the way medical specialists make diagnoses. So the particular clinic in which someone is seen has information for confounding. The, the tests that get ordered with the same set of symptoms, different people will order different tests because they will think with the different background about what those symptoms are telling them. So, so all of that is critical in interpreting any, any part of this phenome space. If we think of, you know, a lot of my studies, so, so right now we do a lot thinking about finding, finding pleiotropic effects of genes. So if we have a polygenic score for schizophrenia and we see an association to lipodystrophy, you know, we want to think of that as a, a pleiotropic consequence of some of the same genetic variation. But of course, Many of the drugs used to treat schizophrenia have lipodystrophy as a side effect of their use. And, and so this is not, this is, when you, if you condition on the schizophrenia diagnosis, this relationship completely goes away. So the, the polygenic score is associated to lipodystrophy, to, to diabetes, to lots of the features of metabolic syndrome which are in fact consequences of the use of some of the antipsychotic drugs. And, and if you condition on schizophrenia on the people who take the drugs, yeah, there's no 
there's no further relationship. So we do things like this all the time, try to, to look at, at covariates that we think will help us better understand whether there's a relationship and what kind of a relationship there is. And, and one of the things that we have tried to do is understand better how the laboratory values. So we have all these quantitative traits, rich data over many, many people, whether we can find new biomarkers for some diseases that lack them by using, um, using lab values. And so uh, Leah Davis and um, so Leah Davis and one of my senior postdocs and lots of people in the VGI worked for like three years trying to clean up the laboratory values to the point where you could really get the same heritability estimates with laboratory measures from a biobank as you do in research quality data for, for example, LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol, that you would get the same GWAS results that you would see the expected relationships between polygenic, risk score, polygenic scores for disease or for related biomarkers, that you'd actually see the relationships that you expect to see. And so this is an example of uh, polygenics, applying a polygenic score for cardiovascular disease across the laboratory measurements. And on the top you see um, European and African Americans, everybody, and then conditioning out the cardiovascular disease diagnosis. So even without that diagnosis, you see the expected relationship to a lot of the lipid values and strong, more strongly for a pre-treatment LDL level than LDL after treatment with statins. So, so it all makes sense. And we, you know, this is, um, th this was all sort of prelude for trying to, to use more polygenic scores for diseases across the laboratory value data to try to identify new kinds of biology associated to diseases where we had much less biology. And, and, a lot, and there's been some really interesting findings from that with respect to <clears throat> depression and cardiovascular disease and relationships to things like um, white blood cell counts neutrophil counts, which seem, seem to be a mediating factor in this biological relationship between depression and cardiovascular disease. Uh, yeah? Maybe something I missed. So you're applying polygenic risk scores to the lab data, but you don't have genetic... You yeah, this is, this is in the part of the data where we have, where genetics. We have genetics. Yeah, yeah. So this is in the... Right. So okay. about... about so, so the, the number of Europeans is about 65,000. The number of African Americans, there's about 15,000 um, subjects. And so that's the sample sizes those are based on. Yeah. Do you have time stamps for the diagnostic? I'm sorry, what? Do you have the time stamps for the diagnostic? Yes, so we do have the time. So as part of the de-identification of data in the biobank, there's a date shift which is going to wreak havoc for the people trying to study COVID downstream. But, and, but you can always, we can use, so this, the phenome data comes from what we call the synthetic derivative, which is the completely de-identified version of the electronic health record. There's also a research derivative that is not de-identified and not date shifted. You can always do that's the same research. You just have to get an IRB protocol approved to do research in the the non-de-identified part of the data. But that's critical when you need the right, when you've got a real cohort effect. Um, so one example that what we were already trying to get, get working is for a while insulin was hugely expensive for people who didn't have insurance. And there are many of the, because Tennessee never extended Obamacare, uh, <laughs> The state doesn't pay for their meds. They just pay for their kidney transplants when they don't use their meds. So, so we, so many diabetics were unable to use to get their insulin as much as they needed. And one of the consequences of high 
glucose during pregnancy is congenital anomalies. And so we hope that we won't find over those years where insulin was very expensive, we hope not to find an increase in the number of congenital anomalies born to women with diabetes, but that's one of the, that's one, an example of one of the projects that we do through the RD, the research derivative, where we have the actual dates. And what, what we'll have to do with COVID eventually, because of the date shifting and the time period of the epidemic, the data will be spread over way more years than it actually occurred. And we'll, we'll be better off doing the research and the research derivative than the synthetic derivative data. But oh, at this meeting, the main confounding that I, I, wanna, I wanna get people thinking about, and I'm, I'm gonna present on Wednesday a more detailed dive into this. But I wanna give especially the younger half of this audience the freedom to make more conjectures about what the what kinds of factors contribute to an observation like this so let me walk you through this in the context of of applying a lot of polygenic risk scores in bioview so one of the things that we are committed to doing is taking every polygenic risk score, every polygenic score from the polygenic risk catalog that they maintain in the UK for all the polygenic scores that have been devised and running them through BioView so that people can see the relative performance of different kinds of scores and we want to federate it so that anybody can put in a score and see what it looks like across BioView. But one of the things that we look at and we create output for is the proportion of high FST SNPs that have high weights in the resulting polygenic scores. Because what I'm showing here is by birth cohort, the age, the, the year of birth age. Um, so this ranges from 1908 to 1938, 38 to 68, 68 to 88. 88 to 2008, and then 2008 to 2020. So the same polygenic risk score applied to people born in this period, and then over time. And what you see in the orange is this interesting negative slope for height, and in the purplish pink, similarly interesting negative slope for years of education. There are a number of blood related cell counts in black that don't have any effects over this time. Um, and, but then many other traits, BMI included, that have a positive slope over this period. What, can you what is the y-axis here? So, so the y-axis is just the, the value of the the PRS score applied to this set of individuals, what's right? The, what's the scale relative to yeah. population variation? Um, so the scale is the, is the, is whatever, however they set up the scale to be, right? So it's a little different for different scores, but it's just, um, it, it's, it's the same for any given measure, right? These are all, rel you know, essentially relative risks, right? Um, so, I mean, we, we often use them. If we're going to use them in a biobank, what you're doing is saying you're in the upper 1% of the tail. Your risk for disease is, you know, t three times that of people in the lower 1% of the tail or the lower half of the distribution. So that's... Th Polygenic risk scores are being delivered to people today with that information. So the same information is being delivered to people at these ages as people at those ages, and right? And people are not getting shorter. Well, okay, so we'll learn more about that on Wednesday. But, but actually, um, although height increased fairly dramatically 
in the US till mid-century. It's been very flat since then. So overall height in the US increased from about 1900 to 1950, and then, and then has flattened out. We, we have enough protein here. I mean, we're over proteined. Yeah. So you, your interpretation is that there is some bias in the polygenic risk scores and not the change in Well, no. I, I mean, I think there, we need to entertain a lot of hypotheses. I just told you. Yeah, you, yes, please. The, so this is years of education. So there's BMI and the other, the other blue one at the top is ADHD. Yeah. Okay, and my, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, so, so are there changes in how frequently diagnoses are made over time? ADHD is an example of a disease that is more commonly made now. I mean, how many people born in 1938 would have gotten a diagnosis of ADHD in their lifetime? Yeah, few. <laughs> Right? So, so there are definitely diagnoses that are more, more frequently made now. Um, and, and, but also... So how would that affect this? You're applying the same policy. Yes. So, so the, the prediction... Well, but think about this. The, the polygenic risk scores are built on data in which genetics exist. None of those cases yeah. <laughs> with a diagnosis of ADHD are this old. So, so the data have been built on cohorts of people who are more recent than most of these for ADHD, but not necessarily for cardiovascular disease. Lots of the old data on cardiovascular disease were built here. And cardiovascular disease risk has definitely declined over time, right? So, so yeah, so, so, so there, there's, there can also be changes. I mean, how do we diagnose cardiovascular disease? Partly we diagnose it by things like LDL and other objective findings related to atherosclerosis, but also on some of the symptoms, if you have angina. I mean, so, so and, and the frequency of, of what goes into a diagnosis of cardiovascular disease has changed over time. What, what a physician would have diagnosed as cardiovascular disease at this point is different than the data they would use to diagnose that same thing today. But that wouldn't apply to height, because height has been measured in the same way over time. Yes, it's that, and that's a beautiful point. And it pro we, haven't, we probably haven't changed who gets measured for height over time. It's one of those things that's just always height and weight get taken for pretty much everything and, and always have been. It's just one of those easy things that have always been measured and pretty much been measured the same way. And we can calculate BMI from those height and weight measurements. And it's, it's not likely to be very different over time. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would wonder like, what would be the heritability in your cohort that you say young people versus the heritability yeah, so, we're, so, so, so that was one of the things that we've been thinking about. It could be argued that because the protein levels in the U.S. Have been, were maximized by about 1950, so that there's no, there's no dietary influence on height. Now, people are achieving their genetic height more or less for the last 50 years in the United States. So that could mean that the genetic component to height has increased over the last 50 years relative to back here, which is also not, not exactly how we're, I mean, so this is, the, this is an important point. Yes, height is going to be one of those stable things, and so is BMI in terms of who's measured for it and how they get measured for it, yes. Say it louder, please. Oh, oh, yeah. Dang, yeah, you are so, so, yeah, so tune in on, come on Wednesday for the talk that I'm going to give to everybody because we're going to talk a lot more about um, things like that. Question? So yeah. This, you have the word black at the bottom, so this refer to the... This is the color, the color of the, the color of these um, blood cell traits in the middle, 
and Alzheimer's disease are in black because they have no significant change over time. Those are examples of quantitative biomarkers and one disease where there's really not, there's no, uh, there's no, no, bio, no, no anomalies to this. And in fact, so I mentioned high FST SNPs among the high weight SNPs. So there's a big difference between the proportion of high FST SNPs with high weight um, in these three traits than in the ones that show big differences. So th keep that in your um, thoughts. So, you know, another thing, are there changes in how and or why biomarkers get ordered over time? And there totally are. And some of those kinds of biomarkers are much more frequently used now, like LDL cholesterol in the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease than they were in the past. Um, but, but lots of the biomarkers that are used in diagnosing any condition have changed. Many of these don't actually have biomarkers, though. So major depression is one of these phenotypes, and ADHD, and we don't really have biomarkers for those. Um, so height and BMI independently, maybe, but certainly BMI is a risk factor for some of the phenotypes that have an increase here. So cardiovascular disease, BMI is a risk factor for, for cardiovascular disease. It's a risk factor, it's an, a risk factor for many of the features of cardiovascular, you know, hypertension. BMI is, has a profound effect on the development of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. And so because Hyde has a negative slope, BMI has a, a positive slope. So that, because height is in the denominator of BMI, and you're gonna see that. But BMI itself will be potentially a contributor to the positive slope in some things, because, so although we do expect, because of the negative slope in height, for BMI to have a positive, BMI is not hugely increased in real things, but it's not likely to be due to the genetics, right? I mean. The genetics haven't changed over 30 years, but Americans' BMI has changed a lot over 30 years. So again, we m that would suggest less genetics for some of these measures in the later years because the environment has really been having a bigger impact, even though the environment is probably having a smaller impact on, on height. And then, the truth is that age isn't always, so in the data sets where we generate the, the polygenic scores from, age is one of those not very interesting covariates that may or may not have been taken adequately into account in the original GWAS studies from which we build the polygenic scores. And so that's another thing to think about as a contributing factor to some of the observations. But I also, we also talk about confounding, classic confounding, classic genetics confounding, inadequate correction for genetic ancestries. And the reason that could matter for, in particular, for, for the, the ones with the strong slopes, I mean, here's height, actual measured height across Europe. Where does a lot of the data for estimating the effect sizes for variance for height come from? Europe. So you have this true confounding of many of original, true original allele frequency clines for the settlement of Europe. So a lot of, a lot of emigration from, you know, migration from Africa through the Middle East into Europe. Um, so there's huge allele frequency clines on this southwest to northeast, uh, nor southeast to northwest axis. So there are clines in allele frequencies and there are clines in height. And um, so, well, this has always been known and of course in all the GWAS, people correct using principal components for ancestry. But in big data sets, 
it turns out to be really hard to correct adequately for this particular kind of confounding within a, a relatively homogeneous population because there, there are truly allele frequency clines that run this and there, are, there is a true height cline and how do you separate the alleles that truly affect height from the alleles that are just part of the same cline on which we see these. And so there, was, there were a, a series of papers drawing attention to this because the height data had shown a lot of evidence for natural selection across Europe. Uh, positive selection for increasing height across Europe. And, you know, this, this is a real fun thing for population geneticists, polygenic adaptation. And then when the data came out from the UK Biobank and people used the UK Biobank to try to replicate results that had come from all over Europe, that was not significant evidence for natural selection for height. And it got tracked down to some, some failure in the early data from across Europe to adequately correct for this, this problem. And, and the quote from the Berg et al. So there were several papers, including from some of the original groups that collected the data, um, that said, you know, so the, this, this kind of confounding is most acute for samples from heterogeneous ancestries. So these are heterogeneous in the sense that there really are allele frequency clines, but they're all European ancestries. Um, and this is because while the bias in detection and effect sizes at any individual locus is small, the systematic nature of biases across many loci um, compound the, the effect sizes at over the, so that there are significant errors at the level of the, the polygenic scores. And so this error would in, inflate the proportion of the variance in polygenic scores that is among populations. Okay, so, so this is what I want you to be thinking about and what I'd love to have some discussions um, with anybody about over the next, uh, over the week. Um, but I'm going to come back to this on Wednesday and provide more data and more, more non-genetic information on how confounding like this can actually be exacerbated by other facets, other historical activities related to migration. So that the issues in the United States in particular May, may be really confounded. And you know, he's like spoiled my whole story for Wednesday, but that's okay. Everybody be thinking about it. And I've got then a lot more data to show. And I probably, I hope I didn't, yeah, I did go over, sorry. I, um, but we'll, yeah, go ahead. But we, we talked in the middle too, it's okay. I just have a question in Louder. I'm sorry, on income levels. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of data for both height and BMI related to income levels. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, I, so it's not that I doubt the data, but there are often going to be multiple interpretations to the observations. And I think we, we have to be very careful about, so, so there are certainly data in Europe and in the United States that Height, male height, is associated with higher um, income, positively associated with higher income. And especially in women, higher BMI is associated with lower income. And, and you know, so, so there are definitely associations. But they may be far more complex than is necessarily appreciated from from just the statistics. And, I, and so that's what I, I want to draw people's attention to um, and with some of the additional data I'll present on Wednesday. But, but it's really worth thinking through as many kinds of explanations for, because we are not the only biobank that sees this. Biobanks all over the United States see these same kinds of things. 
but I don't expect actually to see them in some biobanks. And, that, and this is where I think um, it's going to be really interesting as more and more data come online for these kinds of studies. So anyways, thanks everybody and it was really fun to get to talk with you today.